Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 22. The Bible says in straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if thou, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. I want to preach this morning on a thought that God gave me while I was sitting there and I began to put it down while those young people, I could hear them in the background of laughing and singing and enjoying a day in camp. I want to preach this morning on the subject of the safest place in life. The safest place in life. And I trust that you will listen intently and God would speak to our heart. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. The safest place, or I could say this, what is the safest place on earth? Now you say, preacher, it seems kind of weird that you are taking a passage in the Word of God where you have men that are in a storm. Men that are in the middle of a storm and the wind's blowing, the lightning's flashing, the waves are breaking across the bow and they're in the middle of a storm and they're afraid for their very lives. Now, don't you understand this? These men also in the middle of that storm were very aware of the uh, lake or the, uh, the water that they were on. Uh, they had fished that area. They had grown up in that area and yet this storm was so great and this storm was so powerful that they feared for their very lives. They thought we we're going to die. And then all of a sudden in the middle of all that, someone comes walking to the um, on the water. And you say, preacher, where do you find the safest place on earth in the middle of that passage? Well, I want you to look with me for just a moment. And I want to preach a little bit as we go through this chapter. And we'll end up with one of my favorite people in the Bible. And that's Peter and what he does in the end of the chapter. But I want you to notice first of all, the peril that they were in. The peril or the danger. The peril that they were in. It was a storm and by the way, it was a storm in the night on a body of water known for bad storms. Now you say, preacher, how could that be the safest place on earth? How could that be? Well, let me say to you this. His intention put them there. His intention put them there. Do you realize that the reason that the disciples were on that boat in that lake was because Jesus said to them, I want you to get into that boat and I want you to go to the other side. Do you realize in the will of God in their life that they were in that storm and his intention put them there? Now, you know what the safest place on earth is? It's the will of God. It's the will of God. They were in the will of God, Miss Angie. They were doing exactly what God told them to do. Jesus said, get in the boat. How many of you believe Jesus knew the storm would come up? How many of you believe Jesus knew the lightning would flash and the thunder would roll? How many of you believe Jesus knew they would get afraid for their lives? The answer would be yes. Why? Because he sent them there. And he is the master of the sea and of the wind. He knew what they were facing. I 
to give you a thought. I want you to think about this. I shared this with our young people. Just because you're in the will of God does mean not mean that storms won't come. Just because you're doing what God told you to do does not mean that storms won't come. Just because you're serving God does not alienate you. It does not pull you away uh, from storms. Storms will still come in our lives. Storms will still show up. Yes, even in the will of God. Amen. Hey, listen, the pearl they were in. I want you to watch this. You see in the word of God, the intention, his intention put them there, but his intercession preserved them there. Say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Guess what Jesus was doing while they were in the storm? He was praying for them. He was praying for them. Hey, while they were in the middle of that storm, hey, it's one thing to have the preacher pray for you or a good loving uh, son of, uh, a, a child of God or a good loving friend that loves the Lord praying for you. But friend, there ain't nothing like having Jesus uh, to pray for you. And in the middle of that storm, while they think they're going to die, Jesus is praying for them back on the land. How many of you are glad in the will of God Jesus prays for you? How many of you are glad in the will of God Jesus is there for you? How many of you are glad in the will of God when you're trying to do what God? It may get stormy at times. It may get difficult at times. But friend, if we're saved, we are never alone. Somewhere standing in the shadows, you're going to find God. And God's going to be there. And he's going to be praying for us and helping us and encouraging us. Hey, the per- They were in the perfect will of God for their life. But they were in a storm. Why? Because his intention put them there. Why? Because his intercession, his intercession not only put them there, but his intercession preserved them and took care of them and kept them and watched over them. Amen. Every day of your life. Every day of your life. Amen. You get your life in the will of God. You do what God wants you to do. You get where God wants you to be. And here's what I told our young people. Quit walking around and say, well, I'm waiting on the will of God. Hey, don't wait on the will of God. Get in the will of God now. Find you somewhere and get in the will of God and serve God and do what God wants you to do. We don't need to be sitting around doing nothing. There are buses to be worked on. There are gospel tracts to be handed out. There are choirs to sing in. There are ministries to work in in Calvary. Don't just sit around saying, well, I'm just right that's a cop out friend get in the will of God and do something for Jesus and make your life count for God amen the pearl they were in they were in the safest place on earth in the middle of a storm brother Parquet in the middle of a worst storm them guys probably had ever been in on that lake they were safe they were safe amen number two the panic they experienced. Even in the will of God, it can get stormy, and sometimes we panic. Am I right? Now you pray for me. If you're a lot stronger than me, you're a lot stronger, you pray for me. But there are times in the middle of tough times, I get a little panicky. Amen. I know you got your halo and wings hanging in the back, but mine aren't back there. If anything's horns, amen. Hey, so I'm telling you this, sometimes in the middle of those storms, all of a sudden you get into panic. Think, Lord, I done miss God. Lord, why am I doing this? Lord, why am I here? Oh, Lord, I thought I was in the will of God. Everything's going wrong. I done made a mess. I don't know what I'm going to do. Friends, sometimes you got to realize his intention got you there. He's where you, he's where he wants you to be and you just got to quit panicking. But I am speaking to people all across the country that panicked over toilet paper. Am I right? I'm speaking to people that panicked over toilet paper. People panic so easy. Amen. Yesterday, you know, my wife's got calls from me for, for a lot of years about accidents. I raced dirt bikes 28 years. She's heard the call many a times. I've crashed a few bicycles since I've been riding them. I, I, I may just have to take up pickleball. I don't know. But uh, I'll get hurt in that too, I'm sure. James hit me upside the head with a paddle or something. But I want you to listen to me. Uh, when I called her yesterday, uh, we, we were out on a big bike ride yesterday. And we were on the 55-mile route. 
and most of the 55, I'm going to get in here. Most of the 55, most of the 55 mile route uh, were those that were riding faster. So we was averaging about 19, 20 mile an hour pace. On the road that we were on, uh, we were averaging, we were running about 25 miles an hour. And the girl right in front of me, uh, probably a little inexperienced, touched the tire of the bicycle in front of her at 25 miles an hour. I saw her do this and do that and then fall right in front of me. Say, preacher, what'd you do? I ran over her. <laughs> now, I'm not going to lie to y'all. Please don't tell anybody this. But I knew I was going to hit the ground. I figured it was her fault. So I tried to land on her. <laughs> I figured landing on her is a lot better than landing on that cement. Amen. But anyway, when I hit, another bike crashed, another bike crashed, another bike crashed, another bike crashed. I literally was on the ground watching 15, 20 bicycles flying over my head. I looked down, my bicycle was broken seven pieces. $6,000 bicycle. Electronic shifting, whole nine yards. Seven pieces. You know what I first thought I had was? Trick is sending me a new frame anyway. Because that one had a defect in it, so it ain't going to cost me nothing. So I thought, well, hallelujah, I've been blessed already. Then I looked down, blood's running down my leg, blood's running down my arm. And I thought, call Wendy, she's going to look at Firewire. <laughs> so what did I not want her to do? I didn't want her to panic. So I got over there, made sure some of my friends were okay. Everybody was okay, just some scratches and bruises. Everybody fine. And I got over there, and I called her, and I said, Wendy, you're going to look at Firewire in a minute, because it pops up on her phone. And I said, when you look at Firewire, you're going to see there's been a bicycle wreck. Over on Jennings Road. Yes, I'm in it. And I'm okay. Can you come pick me up? Amen. What was I doing? I was trying to stop her from panicking. I was trying to stop her from going, Lord, he's done it again. Amen. I was trying to stop her. And I said, it wasn't my fault. But I was trying to stop her again. You say, preacher, what are you going to do? I'm going to go ride my bicycle. Exactly what I'm going to do. You say, why? Because I'm, you know, I, I may not crash enough. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say to you is this. In the will of God of your life, in the will of God. Hey, when I fell yesterday, when I got hurt, th- I've still been in the will of God as far as ministry is concerned. But sometimes you get panicky in the will of God. I tell people all the time for me, this is how I make it through. And you take my advice. I've been doing this 37 years. Let me share with you how I make it through in 37 years of what I've been doing. Ministry to me is not personal. It's ministry. I don't panic over it. Oh, preacher, did you hear somebody didn't like you? Well, that's news. Well, hallelujah, I didn't know that. Well, preacher, did you hear so and so? Listen. It, you got to say, it's not personal to me. This is what God called me to do. God called me to preach the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God. God called me to stand against the liquor industry and the beer industry. God called me to stand against uh, all the things that destroy people's lives. God called me to preach the gospel. God called me to stand for what's right. And I'm not going to panic every time somebody don't like what I'm preaching. Right? Here's your life. If you're in the will of God for your life, if you are doing what God wants you to do, you're in the will of God. Don't be panicking. So it's not going to always go great. I'm amazed how many people go to church. Soon as something goes a little bit sideways, they jump on, they jump ship. Right? Oh, oh, it just ain't perfect. I got news for you. Please don't come here if you're looking for a perfect pastor and perfect people. You need to go, if you're perfect, Find you some perfect folk. And y'all go be perfectly good together. But I promise you here, there's a whole lot of folk with flaws. Amen. 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 And I'll say this. The will of God is one of the best places to be. It's safe. It's safe to be in the will of God. Amen. 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 Brother Brad and I watched some guys jump out of an, and his wife watched some guys jump out of an airplane last night in complete darkness you could barely see a speck of light on the plane. And then about four of them, military from Fort Bragg, jumped out of that plane. One of them bringing a big American flag on his back. Had sparks flying off their leg where they turned in pyrotechnics on. They were coming down. Brother Brad and I were sitting on the ground watching that. I can look over Brother Brad and I can say this, Brad, you and I are in the will of God. I don't want to be up there. That's great for them boys. But I don't want to be up there. I'm going to stay right here where I'm at. Amen. Right? 
You better get in the will of God. Then boys up there knew what they were doing. That's what they do. They serve their country. They jump out of planes. What do I do? I stay on the ground. Amen. The panic. I got to keep going. Number three, watch this. Not only do you see the pearl they were in, the panic they experienced, but don't you see this, the person they encountered. The person they encountered. He said, it is I, be not afraid. Once they realize it was Jesus, Peter immediately wants to go to him. Watch this. Once they realize he was the one walking on the waves. Can I tell you this? If you're in the perfect will of God for your life, if you are in God's will for your life, if you are doing what God wants you to do. And by the way, I told our young people, uh, that goes for your dating life. That goes for your marriage life. That goes for the job. That goes for a school. That goes for everything you're looking at in your life. You've got to get in the will of God. Do what God wants you to do. And if you're a Christian, the Lord will be there with you right in the middle of it. Am I preaching right this morning? Now I want you to watch this if you would just a moment. The Bible says that they were all in the will of God and they're on that boat. The storm's still raging. Jesus comes up. Peter realized and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come to thee on the water. I want to give you three things real quick and I'll be done this morning about the will of God. Looking at it in Peter's life. Bless his heart. He, he, has, so, he has so much preaching material. I mean, from the, the, the denial uh, to, to, Lord, I'll never forsake you, to preaching on Pentecost and thousands saved. He's the only one in this building or the world that's ever besides Jesus walked on water. He did it. He absolutely did it. Miss Natalie, if you could have walked on water, you would have never twisted your ankle on the rock. Ain't that right? You could have walked right across the water. So he did it. He got up. Look, I want you to know some things about Peter. First of all, I want you to see his desire. His desire. Do you know I believe the bravest thing that Peter ever did, ever did in his life before Pentecost was step out of that boat. Was step out of that boat. I believe that's the greatest, greatest thing of bravery he ever did. The storm hadn't stopped. The storm had not stopped. The storm didn't stop until Peter and Jesus got in the boat. He steps out in the middle of the storm. His desire. Let me ask you a question today. Do you have a desire to get out of the boat, out of your comfort zone and go to Jesus? Let me give you a couple things I want you to think about. I jotted these down. Listen to this. Why did Peter get out of that boat? I believe there's two reasons. Number one, he wanted to be like Jesus. Is anybody with me? He wanted to be like Jesus. If Jesus could walk on water, hey, what does the Bible say Christians are? We are Christ-like. What is God making us to go toward? To be more like Jesus. You know why Peter wanted to walk on that water? Because he's hero. Because the one he looked up to. Because the one that saved him was walking on water. And he said, I want to be like him. And can I say this to you today? If you're in the will of, your, will of God in your life, one of the greatest desires of your life is, is you ought to want to be like Jesus. You ought to want to be like Jesus. That's ought to be the greatest desire of your life. I want to be like Him. But I want you to know something else I thought about when I was doing this. Not only did He want to be like Jesus, He wanted to be with Jesus. Are y'all ready for this? It's safer walking in the water in a storm with Jesus than on the boat without Him. It's safer walking with Jesus, with Jesus. It is safer walking out in the storm on the water than it would be in the boat without him. When's the last time you wanted to be with Jesus? You do, but you don't like to get out of the boat. Because if I get out of the boat, I leave my comfort zone. If I get out of the boat, I, it makes me a little nervous. If I get out of the boat, I'm not really natural here. My right brother Corey. Uh, listen, in my life, I, it's amazing that I preach to teenagers. Pre teenagers can be intimidating. I'm serious. Teenagers look at you like you ain't got a lick of sense. And I, so I preach a lot to teenagers and young people. It's amazing I do it because I'm really introverted. That is the truth. When I'm in front of people preaching, I don't have that problem. But I just don't like to be around people 
that I don't know or around people. I'm just an introvert. I'm just, I have zero personality. I have to make up my personality. Honestly. Because, you know, I, it ain't that I don't like her. I'm just kind of blah. And I married zippity doo dah. You know what I'm saying? So it's a contract. Salt and pepper. But I want to tell you this. It's no problem for me to get out of the boat when it comes to them. Because they're the will of God for my life. I told Brother Shelton, I said, Brother Davey, I'm 57 years old. I've been doing youth meetings for 30 years. I said, you need to get somebody else to this meeting. He looked at me and said, Preacher, have you noticed what God's done this week? I said, yes. He said, you booked until the rapture. I said, Brother Davey, they're going to get tired of some old gray-haired guy preaching to them. He said, do they look like they're tired of it? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Y'all don't look like you're tired of it, do you? <laughs> Help me, Hunter. <laughs> Listen, he wanted to get to Jesus. Can I tell you something? I'm so sick of people, excuses in church and, and, and little junk all the time and drama. You know why you ought to go to church? You ought to go to church because you love Jesus. Amen. You ought to go to church because you want to walk with Jesus. You ought to go to church because you want to see Jesus. You ought to go to church because you want to be like Jesus. And you ought to leave all that other junk in that miserable life outside of here. And you ought to just go to church and love the Lord. Can I get a witness? That's why I go. Come in here today for a pat on the back. I like a pat on the back, but I don't have to have it. I didn't come in here today and think oh, altar service don't go a certain way. It's not good. It'll go the way God wants it to go. That's all I can do is pray about it and let God have it. Amen. I love Calvary. I, can you hear me? I love Calvary Baptist Church. This is where I want to be. I love my church. I love the people here. They're not perfect. This is where I want to be. This is the will of God. And if I got to get out of the boat every now and then, and I got to walk on a wave, and I got to get to Jesus, and I got to enjoy his fellowship, then hallelujah, I say get out of the boat. I'm glad I said that. Amen. Amen. Is anybody with me? Amen. Are y'all with me? Amen. First of all, his desire. Second of all, his decision. Now watch this. He said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come. That's a desire. Then Jesus said, come. Here's his decision. Oh, it's easy to look at that roller coaster that flips 14 times. Drops a thousand feet in half a second. And you say, I want to ride that. Then somebody says, I'll buy you a ticket. What are you talking about, Willis? You'll buy me a ticket. Yeah, don't you want to ride it? Well, you know, I was just kind of talking. Oh, no, we're going to ride it now. See, it's one thing talking about getting out of the boat. Lord, if I'm you, let me come to you. Jesus said, come on. It's one thing for Jesus to walk on water. <laughs> it's another thing for you to walk on water. Right. Right. Amen. Am I preaching right? It's desire. But then that decision comes. I tell our young people. By the way, I tell y'all we have a great group of young people. You keep your mouth off my young people. Well, I know some of them ain't perfect. Well, I know people raising them ain't real perfect. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. You leave them alone. They got a heart for God. Don't you throw no blanket on them when they're trying to get on fire for God. Yeah. A lot of times what happens, and I'll say this in my own church, a lot of times what happens when young people get on fire for God, mom and daddy get nervous and it's going to make them have to get right. right. That's when they start trying to throw a blanket on them or carry them down to church using the NIV. Amen. Let me get them out of that stuff. Get them, they get under conviction. Then mom and daddy start getting, I got to get out of that conviction. Got to get out of that conviction. My young and doing coming home telling me I, we had a mama. Now the mama don't go to church here, but we had a mama said said about her son. This is for camp said about her son. Lord, he's preached to me the whole day. And the daddy said, "So, am I right?" Let me ask you a question: Have you ever made your decision to get out of the boat and get in his wheel? Have you ever made your decision to do what he said? Happiest day of my life, Brother Doug. Happiest day of my life. Besides the salvation Sunday was the very next Sunday when I surrendered to preach the gospel. I didn't realize what God was going to do in my life. I had no idea. Here I am now 37 years down the road of that. Really more than that, but just preaching wise. 17 when God saved me. A week later God called me. But I really started, I started pastoring 20, which should have never happened. But anyway, uh, and those folks still going to heaven, I'm glad. But anyway, 37 years. 
Man, I thought yesterday, I had a fellow yesterday at the bike shop. You know, everybody loves Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus. Don't matter if they got a fifth of liquor. Don't matter if they're drunk as a skunk. Don't matter if they cuss every other breath. Everybody loves Jesus. Right. A fellow asked me yesterday. He said, what do you think about your bike? I said, well, Trek sent me enough rain. I said, I got to come more home. He said, I wish I could live your life. I said, you can. Amen. Don't ever say stuff like that to me. He said, boy, you got a good life. I said, yeah. He said, what are you doing? Are you going to go back to your church and take up an offering and get you another bicycle? I said, I ain't thought about that, but. I said, no. I said, but I will tell you this. I said, I love Jesus. He loves me. Take care. And, he said, and the fellow said to me, and I believe he meant this. He said, well, I love Jesus. I said, well, great. I said, let me tell you this. I also give the missions and tithe. He said, yeah. He said, you do? I said, yeah. And I said, that's why the other bicycle is sitting home that I can ride. Because God not only supplies all my want, my needs, occasionally He gives me some wants. But you always want that little house you got down there, snow camp, one day. I have to tell y'all, Brother Dave Brass, one of my favorite people on earth. You always, you always wanted that. Didn't need, you didn't have to have it. God didn't have to give it to you, but you wanted it. And you stayed faithful. God lets you retire when houses are selling good. Yeah. Got that beach house sold, moving to the sticks. Yeah. Some of y'all opposite, you being the sticks want to move to the beach. That's why it sold so good. <laughs> Amen. Right. But don't you understand this? It all comes down to decision. Every one of you young people sitting here right now, and y'all know I preached this the other night, but once you decide I'm going to live for God, the next thing that's got to happen is you got to make that decision. I'm going to get out of that boat. We talked about that the other night. You guys prayed about that on the altar. you got to get out of the boat. Brother Corwin, you and your family came to this church. I asked you. I said, look, I'm glad to have you, but it's got to be the will of God because I don't need you here if it's not the will of God. Right. I don't need you here. you got to make that decision. You've got to make that decision. Amen? Amen. And you can make a bad one. You, you can marry the wrong person. You can get the wrong person in your life. I don't know why people don't pray about stuff more before we do it. And I know we're all quick to jump on the trigger. But you think about it, we're making life decisions that we got to live with. And they need to be the will of God because that's the safest place on earth. Real quick and I'm done. Watch this. That was his decision. His desire, I got to get out of this boat. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be where he's at. His decision was, I'm going to get out of the boat. And then I want you to watch this. And anytime, how many believe this? Anytime you do anything for God, the devil don't like it. His despair. When did Peter get in trouble? He got in trouble when he took his eyes off the Lord. Even in the will of God, you got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Can I give y'all something? I want to help. You know, I don't understand why people can't enjoy life. Life's great. I mean, you can enjoy life. I mean, I mean you can smile, enjoy life. You ain't got to sit around gripe and complain about everything and everybody and you're never happy. No, you, you can really enjoy living. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you where people get miserable. is when they take their eyes off of Jesus and they put their eyes on everybody else. Oh, so-and-so goes over to Calvary. Why do you care? Well, they don't really live right. That ain't your business. It doesn't matter. They got a pastor to preach to them, or they'll go somewhere else where somebody will. It's not your job. It's not your job to go look at people all the time. I just told a Spanish church a while ago. Somebody, they've been here preach to them, not up there, but I mean, they've been watching online. It's some kind of lunatic that believes that people ain't right with God or not go to church. That's like saying, if I'm, not, if I'm sick, I shouldn't go to the hospital. Yeah. Right. Really. Amen. I don't know who in the world preached that mess to them. It's crazy. I wonder if I told them today, being a member of a church, you got to live right and do right when we have things. But if you're not a member of church, everybody's welcome to come because it's a hospital for sinners. Right. People need the preaching. They need church. Amen. 
But a lot of people can't enjoy it because they can't take long enough to keep their eyes off other stuff. All the time. Well, I, I heard old so-and-so. Who cares, man? I mean, really, who cares? I mean, I hate to say this. I don't want to be mean. But if you fall off tomorrow and decide you're going to quit serving God, that don't change Miss Wendy and I's life. We're not going to quit on God because you quit on God. We're just not going to do it. I love you. I love my church. I love church more than I ever have in my life. But I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to go in a ditch with you. Because my desire is I want to be where Jesus is. Am I preaching right, Brother Parkett? Sure I am. People, I'm, I ain't never seen people so miserable in my life. It's crazy. I believe you get up in the morning thinking, now what can I complain about, gripe about? Who can I get my eyes on today so I can make my entire day miserable? Who can I text? Who can I call? Who can I message on Facebook? Who in the world can I get miserable like I am? Here's despair. Are y'all with me? 1206, I'm done. These kids have been preached to for a long time. Y'all appreciated me in that meeting though, didn't you? Y'all had the morning service. Some of them boys was iron 10 minutes. About 25, 30 minutes, I was done. Y'all were smiling. So I was at one night. We stayed for a while. That was y'all's fault. For a moment, he took his eyes off the Lord. Watch this. If you want to be in the safest place on earth, get into the will of God and certainly keep your eyes on Jesus. I typed this down in my notes so I wouldn't forget it. This is my own little thought. It may be a stormy place, but it's always the best place. Amen. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What is the will of God? Well, let me just say this today to all of you in this auditorium. Everybody listen to me. 12 six and a half. Everybody listen to me. The will of God for everybody in this building is for you to be saved. That's the will of God in Christ Jesus. Not willing that any should Paris. If you're here today and you do not know Christ as your Savior, the will of God in the Bible is for you to give your life to God. He died for everybody. If you're here today and you cannot pillow your head and close your eyes tonight and know that you're going to heaven, God's will is for you to be saved. That's God's will for your life is for you to be saved. That's God's will for your life. Let me tell you this. God's will for your life is for you to find His will for your life and get in it. And don't keep waiting on one day. Now's the time. Right. Brother Clark, you need help on buses? Yes, Now's the time. Them Sunday school classes on Wednesday night kicking off now? Now's the time. You need choir members every now and then, Brother James? Now's the time. We need people out praying besides me and Bob? Now's the time. Hey, man, I know you just forgot, but quit forgetting. All right, it's up on the screen. Brother Steve can't do it no better. We need to get in God's will for our lives. Amen? It's a safe place. It's a happy place. How many of y'all like to be happy? Anybody like to be happy? I tell you, some people, I think some people rather climb a tree and be miserable and stay on the ground and be happy. Isn't that the truth? And then some of y'all surround yourself with miserable people. You get around people, gripe, fuss, complain. By the way, if they'll talk about everybody else to you and you think you're their buddies, if they'll run everybody else down, when you ain't around, they're going to run you down. I'm just going to tell you straight up, you can like that whatever you want. I used to use another phrase I want. But I'm telling you, if you think for a minute that people that run everybody down and share good old stuff with you, only do that, they'll do it about you when you're not around just as quick. Because if they were anything right with God, they wouldn't do that anyway. If they had a heart right with God, they wouldn't run people down. They wouldn't gossip and talk about people. Are we still having church? I get sick of that mess. You get around me much and you complain about everybody, I'm going to tell you, take a hike. Honestly, I don't hear all that mess. I don't hear it. Amen. I'm glad your name's Axis and the world revolves around you. Bless your heart. But I don't hear it. I'm going to go home. That pretty little wife I got, she's going to hug me, make me feel so warm inside. That's okay. It's legal. I'm going to go home and enjoy my life God's given me. I'm not going to take you personal or anybody else. I'm going to do what God called me to do. I'm going to preach the word of God. 
And I'm going to enjoy the journey. Because I am in the safest place on earth. You may stand. What a great crowd. What a great spirit. I want to ask you something. Everybody looking up here, right? We're done now. This is invitation time. Do you know invitation time is really when the service ought to really get good? Amen. I'm going to ask you something. What does God want you to do? You're going to always be a person that just says, you know, Peter's a show off. I could have walked on that water if I wanted to. I'll be honest with you. I just didn't want to. Are you going to be one of those people who say, you know what? You know what? I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. Amen.